Welcome. Thank you so much for coming. Um, so some of you know me and some of you don't. I'm Carla Armbruster and I'm a professor in the English department here and I teach one of the sections of 1900 um, and I know many of you are from the Anne section and Sheila section. Um, so I'm glad to meet you and I'm not going to say a whole lot. I'm just going to get right to introducing our panelists. But basically we started having this, a panel of this kind several years ago because we realized there are a lot of misperceptions out there about what you can and can't do with an English major. Mostly people think you can't do things <laughs> with an English major. But you can actually do a lot of things. And so that's why we bring in some of our wonderful alumni every year to talk about what they have done. Um, we could have brought in a lot of other people who do a lot of other things, but based on what you all were interested in, we asked these five wonderful people to come, and um, I know you are going to be incredibly impressed by what you hear. So I'm just going to go ahead and introduce them in alphabetical order. No. Oh, did I set it? I might not have set it up in alphabetical order. <laughs> it doesn't matter. In fact, I would just introduce them in the order that they're sitting in, because I'm flexible like that. <laughs> so um, first, we have Lauren Rhodes who was an English major back in the days when we had only an English major, not English and creative writing, and then you had an emphasis, and her emphasis was uh, literature, society, and politics, which is essentially what the English major is now. And she graduated in 2017. She also earned a computer science minor, and I suspect she might tell you a little bit about how she came to major in English and minor in computer science, um, in case you're curious. So she is currently working at the St. Louis County Library as a library associate and is almost finished with her master's degree in information and library science. We actually find that a lot of our students are interested in library work and want to go on and get um, degrees like that. She also does some freelance editing and typesetting, but she says it is more of a hobby than a source of income. So welcome, Lauren. Literature, Society, and Politics, and that was in 2011. She minored in Gender Studies and Media Communications. So Alex has had many different jobs at the company where she works now. She is currently Director of Content Strategy at OneSpace.com, but she has also had the job titles Content Project Coordinator, Communications Manager, Digital Marketing Strategist, Marketing Manager, Content, senior marketing manager. So I always say Alex is a wonderful example of how having an English major really prepares you to be flexible and learn on the job and move from one kind of job function to the next. Uh, so you'll hear more about that when she's speaking. Um, we, next is Abby Anderson. <laughs> secondary English education, which you pretty much need if you want to teach high school, and that is what she is doing. Um, I believe you worked at Hazelwood last year, right? She taught at Hazelwood School District last year, and this year she is an English language arts teacher at North Point High School in Wentzville School District. I also noticed that you worked for the St. Louis Literacy Corps in 2020. Yeah, so um, that was probably a helpful experience. So again, a lot of people are interested maybe in teaching of some sort, and Abby's going to let you know what it's like and what it's all about. So thank you. Um, and next is Elliot Lawrence. Um, Elliot also graduated very recently in 2021 with an English major, a creative minor, creative writing minor, and a digital media certificate. So during his time at Webster, Elliot worked at the Writing Center and earned the Student Worker of the Year Award and is currently the Editor of Communications at St. Louis University School of Law and also teaches in the St. Louis Community College Continuing Education Program. 
as an instructor. Um, a couple other notable achievement, achievements. Elliot became a veteran in the Air Force and was formerly a staff sergeant um, after six years of ser service, and that happened in April 2022. Currently, Elliot volunteers for PROMO, a group that works to stop anti-transgender legislation in the Missouri courts. Um, in terms of creative writing, Elliot is still writing and submitting to creative writing short story contests and was recently a finalist in the William Van Dyke Short Story Award for the William Van Dyke Short Story Award in Ruminate Magazine, which also published the story. So welcome, Elliot. <laughs> and finally, we have Taylor Grunlow, who some of you may remember as an instructor. Um, but before that, Taylor was an English major here at Webster University with an emphasis in creative writing, and he graduated in 2011. Um, he went on and got an MFA in playwriting at Hollins University um, and has done so many things. So I'm going to tell you a couple of them, but I just want to say Taylor is really my idea of a creative entrepreneur. So he's, he's done so many things from playwriting and drama in the St. Louis area and worked with so many students on so many cool projects and I believe he's also done some script writing, right? So I don't know if he's going to be able to fit it all into 15 mm -hmm. minutes, but um, there's so many um, ways that he has used his, of course, natural talents, but also when he went here at Webster to, you know, I mean, nobody said, hey, Taylor, would you please start a theater company for us, right? Just, you know, with some friends, did it. So that leads me to tell you, he is the artistic director and playwright for the Tesseract Theater Company here in St. Louis. Um, and he is now assistant professor at Missouri University of Science and Technology. Um, and that is why he is no longer teaching for us. So congratulations and welcome to you. Conversely, the St. Louis 
public library, which it operates out of downtown, they do hold on to things for a very, very long time. Um, I think they have at least one book that is about 200 years old because they sent it to us for someone to check out, even though it's a travel guide from 200 years ago. <laughs> Not very helpful to anyone, uh, unless you're doing research. So unfortunately, I don't generally get to use my knowledge of early British literature in my day-to-day -day mm -hmm. job. Um, People rarely ask me questions about Beowulf or Shakespeare, which is unfortunate. Um, but the skill that I use the most, which I started developing while getting this degree, is research. Um, I, you know, sometimes a student comes in and they need books on whales or desert storm, two very different things, but it's happened. Mm -hmm. um, different, different people, not, <laughs> not whales and desert storm. That would be strange. Um, uh, an older person who heard about this one book on NPR but doesn't remember the title, but they know when it, when they heard it. Um, and then I just have to dig into Google and try and track that down. Um, or any other kind of random information. Um, but knowing how to find that has been the most useful skill that I started from here. Uh, so sometimes my searches involve databases that the library is subscribed to. Sometimes it's literally just Google. Um, also, knowing how to formulate a search question is immensely helpful. Um, and my example from um, using that in a degree was when I was doing uh, research on Richard II and Henry V for one of Anne's Shakespeare classes. Um, and I had to try very many different combinations of keywords to find what I was looking for. So knowing how to formulate a search question is so very varied. And, uh, that was definitely a skill that was very helpful, and I've really been able to tweak it and fine tune it as I've gone on. Um, but yeah, knowing how to come up with the keywords is helpful, even if you can't actually help the person find what they're looking for because the book is green, doesn't really help anyone. Anyway. Um, let's see, I also mentioned that I started a book club, ran for about three years, and um, my experience with discussing books having open ended questions in particular, because if you ask someone a question that has one answer, the discussion will not really be a discussion. It kind of just, yes, here's the answer, then you move on. Um, I also took Carla's class on literary analysis, which was A, very fun, and then B, also gave me a perspective that was very useful in leading those discussions, um, which is that people can interpret literature very differently. Um, I actually once got into an argument with someone about Fahrenheit 451 um, because she refused to look at it in any way but the author's way. Um, and I got to use what I learned in class to argue about death of the author, which wasn't as effective as I hoped. <laughs> but not everyone has benefited from an English degree. Um, that was very frustrating. Uh, I'm not so bitter about it. Um, so... So I also did um, a few business writing classes while I was in undergrad. Um, they were offered online at that point, and I have no idea how that all still works, but it was very nice having it online because I didn't have to leave the house. Um, I looked back at my notes, and I think I took writing for the workplace and grant writing. Um, I don't personally use the grant writing class all that much on a daily basis because that is not so much something that I would do in my personal position but there are other areas of the library that would write grants and applications because there's a lot of money out there for libraries to apply for for different programs and that is someone's specific job at the St. Louis County Library particularly. Um, writing for the workplace was helpful just because it went over how to write like emails and notices um, which seems like it would be easy enough but it can be very challenging when you have to write an email to tell someone that they messed up without saying explicitly really messed up. Um, so learning how to be politic in your writing is very helpful. Um, I'm also almost done with my master's in information library and information and library science. Um, that is another area where knowledge of how to research has come in handy. Um, the biggest challenge that I have found from going from the English major to library science degree is that the idea of an essay is very different. Um, here, writing an essay five to ten pages is like, that was what I did, that was how you do it. But, 
Not so much in the library and information science grad school. Your essays are like 500 words and it's very weird. Uh, but learning how to condense what you have to say kind of reminded me of doing uh, essay exams because you have a short amount of time and you have to write what you can. Um, so learning how to be not long-winded was weirdly important. And then beyond that, I will put the phone down, I just really enjoyed my time here at Webster. Um, Carl mentioned that I initially was, well actually she had mentioned it, I had a computer science minor because I started here um, doing computer science, realized I hated it after three <laughs> semesters and it was making me miserable. Um, and I think the first English class I took was actually Sheila's British Writers 2. And I remember writing an email being like, I have some familiarity, I promise I'm not just waltzing in here. Um, and that was my first class and possibly one of my favorites that I got to take. Um, so it made it very easy when I decided, oh, I'll just switch from computer science to English because it's just much, made, made me a lot happier. Um, and I love my time. I miss Pearson uh, many times a day. We were talking about that when we got here. Um, and yeah, just enjoy it. I miss it. If I could, I would just go back to school forever. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm finally done. <laughs> Thank you. Target, Instacart, 
Uh, what I do is I lead our, our content team, so basically the, the, the leg of our client services team that produces copy for our clients. So product descriptions, titles, bullet points, kind of all the copy that you would find on a product page when you're shopping on Amazon. Um, so my path to getting there, as I mentioned, I, I had, or as Carla mentioned, I had a lot of different titles. I started right out of college basically as a copy editor. Um, for but tell our, them what they called it. Uh, it was, they, they were looking for a either copy or content ninja. Um, <laughs> and I was like, oh wow, this, this is me. And I start reading the, the job description about the company and they're like, you know, we have, and we have like a, a massage therapist in the office twice a week. We have a fully stocked bar with like food and drinks and snacks and uh, you know just very Google-esque type mm -hmm. startup company, right? So definitely luring that you know young gullible college kids <laughs> in the door. Um, and I I was like this can't be real. Real. This has to be a fake job listing. Um, it wasn't. It was real. I'm still there 11 years later somehow. Uh, and I, I honestly, I, I love my job because I use what I learned at Webster and the, the things that I've been passionate about my whole life every single day. Uh, so in my role now, I'm responsible for, you know, leading our whole team. So people management is kind of my, my biggest responsibility now. And so you might not think that what you learn as an English major has anything to do with that, but to me as a people leader, I think empathy is kind of the number one thing that guides me. And I think being an English major, getting exposure to different viewpoints um, really lends you to being a little bit more empathetic than, than maybe your average person. Um, and with that, understanding different viewpoints, understanding different target audiences. So I have 10 people on my team right now. We're hiring, so that number's gonna grow to 15, um, who are all very different, all have different communication styles, all you know, re have different experiences, react differently to different things. So I have to you know, learn how to understand people and what will resonate with them and how to deliver messages and feedback um, in a way that, you know, motivates instead of demotivating. Um, a lot of what I do also, obviously, like, I think just kind of having a, a sense of justice as a people leader, so I have to go to bat for my people all the time, whether it's compensation, it's benefits, they're overworked, they're overloaded, um, and I really have to, have to have that people first mindset, and I credit that a lot to my time at Webster. Um, in the English department, but also, you know, the the gender studies philosophy department as well. I think it just really like honed my moral compass as a person. Um, and then obviously writing and editing, right? So my team is responsible for the ultimate deliverable to our client, which is copy and content. And so my job really is establishing what our standards are, how do we create content that achieves our client's goals. Um, primarily those goals are related to, you know, selling more products online. Um, so I play a, a fun part in the leg of capitalism. Okay? <laughs> uh, but, you know, I think, you know, and also we call that basically conversion in, in the, the marketing world. So when somebody lands on a product detail page and they read the copy, they, they want to buy the product. Um, another aspect of that, which you kind of mentioned, is also search engine optimization. So making sure that these products show up, you know, high in search results on the retailer sites for certain search terms. Um, so understanding how those search algorithms work, um, what, what key terms people are searching for that are relevant to the product, and then writing copy that you know, appeals to the consumer and makes them want to buy, but is also um, optimized to show up in search with, with key terms. Um, so <clears throat> with that, um, a lot of it is, is setting standards, um, strategy behind our content, um, and then the other part of it is coaching, you know, our team on how to deliver the content, 
that meets you know the standards that we've set and the standards that our clients expect. Um, so I literally I edit every day, um, and I absolutely love it. <clears throat> In terms of what I wish I would have maybe learned about or done differently in college. Like I've learned a lot on the job, which is you very much can do. I think I could have fast-tracked myself in some areas if I would have studied, taken, not even necessarily minor, but just maybe taken some classes or had some exposure to so things like just marketing, business in general. Um, I think writing for the workplace, um, I, I'm sure that was offered when I was here. I didn't take advantage of it. I didn't think that I was gonna go down this path if you would have asked me 11 years ago, like, what, what do you, where do you see yourself in 11 years? It would not be doing this. Um, but in hindsight, I think that any business marketing classes you can take, if, as, you know, in this day and age, any job you're probably gonna get is for a business. And so, and even if you're, if you're self-employed or you're, you're publishing your own books, like, you're a, you're a business, and so knowing how to market yourself, knowing how to market your talents, I think that is all really, really valuable. Um, and, you know, I think obviously giving and receiving feedback in my role is something that's really important, not only as a, a people leader, but also obviously for, you know, the content that we create, the writers that I work with. Um, and I, I see on a daily basis um, that people who are not, who come from fields where feedback is not a regular part of their like day-to-day -day life or educational experience, that that is much harder both to give and receive. And so I think all the time spent workshopping papers, having group discussions, um, getting feedback. I remember the first time I got a C on a paper from Murray and I was like, oh my God, I've never gotten a C on a paper before. Am I a horrible writer? And then I just like went to Murray and I was like, Murray, like help me. And he he helped me. He gave me really great actionable feedback. Um, I'm a better writer today because of it. Um, and he taught me how to deliver feedback in a way that is constructive and helpful instead of a way that makes someone feel small or you know not good enough. Um, that's a lot, I lost track of time. I feel like I've been talking forever. There's so much more that I could say. Um, all in all, I, if I had to do it all over again, I would do the exact same thing I did before, except maybe a marketing business class. Um, but I wouldn't trade my time here for anything. Thank you all. For Like, you know, and in some ways that's, like, the, people think of it as a fallback. Well, if I can't figure anything else out, I can't, I will teach. That is not the way it works. And I think Abby can, can tell you that, I mean, it is a great career path for English majors, but it is not easy. It requires a second degree, um, and you have to be very intentional about it. And Abby really was, you know, and was, you know, I think, such a great um, community builder among other students who were who were doing the English education, English and education, and I think that um, it's just important to see that it's a good thing to do. But it's not just what you do if you don't wind up doing anything else. So, with that said, I'll let you tell your story. I have note cards if you don't mind. Yeah, yeah. Or I'll, start, I'll ramble forever. <laughs> I'm sure. That's all about. I had notes and then I just started rambling. Like, oh, it's probably been 30 minutes. <laughs> well, it's okay. I'm just sort of backpack off the ground. So, if you guys don't use to do all that, I just want to let you know like, you've got to have like a why for it. You've got to have a passion for it. If you don't, it's going to make the hard days really, really hard. And the hard days are already hard enough. Um, so, and the first thing I wrote was why I love my English degree. So <laughs> I I love my English degree. I am so glad I chose to kind of like do a double major. And if it wasn't for Carmela, I wouldn't have thought about doing it. And it 
really like just so grateful that I did it because it makes me feel like less of an imposter when I talk to other English teachers and they're talking about Flannery O'Connor <laughs> all these great things and if I had not taken one of Murray's classes for my English major I would have no clue who Flannery O'Connor was because I wasn't exposed to it until I came to Webster and so it makes me feel way more educated when I walk into the classroom as a teacher which when you have freshmen and sophomores stare or like high school students not college students staring at you asking when you're going to need this in the real world or what is this I feel more equipped to answer that question and those questions are really scary coming from teenagers <laughs> <laughs> I think also what I really loved about my English degree is it really helps me see what good educators look like outside of high school so like in high school, I loved my English teachers. I had some really great history teachers, like I loved them. But then when I got to the English department here, like I continually saw great teachers. I saw Sheila and Anne and Carla and Murray and Meg Gregory. Like all of them were just fantastic educators, and it kind of helped me see, you know, what the standards are for high school, not high school, sorry, what the standards are for college, and how I can equip that when I teach in a high school classroom, and just how I can still be a good educator, like learning from you guys. Thank you for that. Um, basically, with an English degree, when you're an English teacher, you use it every day to teach. I mean, today they we listened to a speech from Emma Watson from 2014. We analyzed rhetoric. They're not writing a paper on it yet, but they're going to write a rhetorical analysis paper on it. I'm not going to give them a five to ten page limit because I think they would kill me. Um, but we're going to go for like two pages this time, or some something, something good, um, something good. So. You know, we're not at that stage yet, but I think knowing what the end goal is when they get to college has been the most helpful. And I know my English degree from Webster was like high quality, high standards. Um, okay, I said all of that. <laughs> Sorry, if I don't have slides, I will go forever. Um, so what it's like being a teacher. I, you know, you go in, you perform improv in front of 25 to 30 people every single day, and you really hope the joke lands and sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it does, and it feels really great. It's it's really scary the first day of school every year, not knowing like who you're going to meet, what the class is going to be like. In every year, it's only my second year. But both years, I'm like, I can't do this. I'm just going to walk out the door. I'm not coming back. And then it's fine. I love my classes now. When we're 12 weeks in, going on 13 weeks, so it's it's scary, but I don't know. I really love it. I don't remember where I was going, but it says communicating with various levels. So um, I communicate with my colleagues who are, I mean, one of them teaches at a college, so I know he's really well educated and kind of scares me a little bit. Mm -hmm. But then I also talk to my students who are freshmen who have never read a novel before. And so I'm learning how to communicate across all these different levels. And I think being here and taking these classes really helped with that. Um, Finding and discussing relevant literature has been really important to me because I didn't want them to just read Romeo and Juliet and like that's it. Because it's so much fun when we do that at college and we have a discussion with it and then we like memorize a scene from it and we perform it or like we would have if COVID hadn't been a thing. I digress. Um, but I, I feel like being here opened my eyes to the kind of like diverse literature that there are, that there is in the world, sorry. Um, and I, I don't think I was exposed to that in high school. So really helped with that. It also can you give a couple of examples of are there any things you read here that you are not teaching? Um, I taught and I didn't teach all of it, but I taught the first page of a good man is hard to find to look at full characterization of the grandma and the kids had a blast with it. They were like, who is this old lady? And I was like, oh, guys, just wait. Or I was like, we're not gonna read the whole thing. When I say short story and it's fifteen pages, they're like, this is not a short story. <laughs> it's a short story guys, but uh so we just read the first page, but they loved it. Um, I really want to incorporate with Romeo and Juliet some of like the other Shakespeare plays, so I want to like have a Midsummer Night Dream in there, and then like we're also supposed to do Julius Caesar, and it's uh, there's a lot of Shakespeare stuff going on right now with these two units for English one and English two, but I think I don't know. The Good Man is hard to find. Is the biggest thing that I think is using, and it's uh, I wouldn't have used it if I hadn't been here. So, um, but like along with being here. In my classroom, I like to create civil discourse, and civil is the key word because I don't want them throwing pencils at each other, <laughs> which will happen if it gets ugly. Uh, so just being able to have open conversations, I think, with students is something that I was shown here by the students when I was here, and like also by the professors when they were like moderating it, kind of. Although you guys didn't really moderate it, we just kind of like went at it. 
but it helps, it helped. Um, and then just also ensuring that students have the tools to be lifelong thinkers. I feel like Webster's motto is like, we're all lifelong learners. And it was, it seems kind of cheesy sometimes, but I tell my students that they're lifelong learners and readers and writers, and they're gonna be doing this forever, so might as well get good at it. Um, I, don't, I don't know, that's what I liked about my English degree. And then I wrote, what you can do now. Sorry, I have to section my thoughts into like these big bullet points. Um, so if you wanna become a teacher, take education classes with the School of Education while you're here. Even if it's just like one class, just to see if you like the feel of it. If you don't like it, that's okay. But like, try it out before you do it, before you spend a bunch of money on a degree and you hate it. Um, I would definitely suggest taking a business writing class. They talked about writing in the workplace. If it wasn't for that class, I don't think I would have gotten a job because you write a resume, you write a cover letter, you do all of these things. I got my, so I taught at the same school that I student taught at last year after I applied to like 20 different schools. No one wanted a brand new first year teacher. Totally get it. Uh, but after that, I was like, I want a job closer to home. I want a job where I kind of have the freedom to teach students what they want because I was kind of stifled before at my first school that I had, which I still love it. But it was hard to be told exactly what to teach and what to teach it. And so I wanted to kind of like broaden my horizons if it wasn't for the writing in the workplace class, I don't think I would have gotten hired at the school that I'm at, because it really helped me learn like how to have those things that you need for a job interview. And then, like I said before, if you want to be a teacher, you really have to figure out your why, so talk to professors, talk to peers, literally whoever will listen to you, like talk to them about like what your why is, figure that out before you do it, because it's essential. So, that's it. Thank you. Which is strange for me because um, 
when I was at Webster, I was working about three jobs um, in order to continue to go to school, and my grades weren't the best, but uh, sometimes I get to go to like legal service dinner, and the people call me sir, and I'm like, <laughs> They'll email me, they'll be like, Mr. Elliot Lawrence. And I'm like, yes, what do you want? <laughs> and it's like a fancy lawyer from like someone. They're like, would you please talk about me in the next article? And I go, I'll think about it. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason that I, would, I got this position, I feel like it's because of things I was able to do at Webster that was outside of the classroom. So, like we can, you know, I, you all talk about how amazing the classroom is. I want to talk about a bit more about the opportunities that you get at Webster because of the professors and because of the other departments. Um, so, I was an English major with a minor in creative writing and a certificate in digital media. And if I can endorse anything, it is to look at the certificates um, because, you know, at, you know, we all have like three to four minors. Um, but the certificates that Webster provides are, um, it's more, it's broader than a minor. Um, with my creative writing minor, you know, I had a very specific list of classes. With my digital media certificate, I took audio production, I took film, I took a website design class, um, I think I took a journalism layout design. So very broad classes I was just kind of interested in. Um, and then I took it and I got this certificate that kind of sets me apart from other people, right? Um, because for my editor position, they needed someone who you know, has you know, the, the writing and the editing background that the English major has. They were also looking for someone who also knew about Adobe and Excel and could like, maybe like, drop us emails and like, things like that and send them out. And so that put me in a different place than other people. Um, so I would really just encourage checking out a certificate. Like if you have like, you know, it's six, it's six classes. So and, you know you could do that in one year, you know three classes a semester if you're able to, and just think about what that could do to like, because when we talk about like writing and editing and things that aren't like specifically literature based, you have to write for something like either whether it's for your products or I write for the law field. Like how is your writing going to appear to people? And typically these days it's technology. Um, so. I've been doing that for about a year. I started in January, um, and a lot of things that I use from Webster are the extra classes that I've taken, um, like those digital media classes that somehow have popped up, because I never knew when I was gonna use them. Like, I don't use my the film class that I took, but I do use the journalism made on design class that I took. And those are just things that, like, if you can really just do like a broad spread of a bunch of different things, eventually you're gonna find a way to use and it's always just good to have those skills in your back pocket as well. Um, other things that I think were really beneficial outside the classroom with Webster was taking on other opportunities that you can see. Um, because as someone who had to work two jobs throughout college, I couldn't really focus a lot on like you know getting a 4.0 with GPA and like doing those things. That was very difficult and. If you go straight into the career field, like they don't typically look at those things. Please do well in your classes. You know, don't <laughs> work hard in your classes. But also, while you're there, think about other things that are going to set you aside. Like, like, um, like when your professor says, like, hey, there's a um, like somewhere you can submit a research paper. Do it. Do it because you can put on your resume, and then they realize, oh, you're published, and that's another point for you. Um, or when. Like if someone asks you to like you know be on the panel or to talk about your experience or just any opportunity that you can get to just do something, I would just pick it up. Even if you know you submit and you don't get published, then you just you just learn how to submit to a contest so that later on you're like you know how to do it. I know that there was um, for the open review there was just like posters in Pearson House and I was like yeah sure whatever and I wrote it up and I actually got published and which was which is helpful because then I could say I'm a published writer on my thing. Um, so that's, really, that's my advice is to just look at outside opportunities that you can do, no matter what it is, whether it's working at the writing center, submitting to a paper, uh, going to a conference, 
anything that you can do to set you apart from other people who just you know, go to class and then go home, that's gonna do wonders for you. Like I work at a law school. I don't know why I do, but I do. <laughs>
and I'm trying to get stuff going elsewhere, screenwriting, because uh, I didn't want to teach. I didn't want to like this is not going to be my thing forever. Um, and so I got over. I took over this theater program, and students started showing up. They really these students um, kind of had this idea that they had to make a sacrifice. Um, this, the world said, hey, if you want a job that pays, you got to go to get an engineering or comp sci uh, degree. Um, and a lot of students came out of high school wanting to do creative writing or theater or acting, and they thought they had to give that up. So um, I've been trying to build a program down there that lets them have every sort of opportunity that an arts program has. And so that's forming at the same time. Um, I went out to LA uh, first week of February 2020. Um, set up a meeting to like, where I sell my first big screenplay and it's about to get kind of made and Tate Diggs is sort of attached to this thing and then March 2020 happens <laughs> and the thing just disappears. So uh, in Missouri we sort of, uh, when does your art form, like theater, right, was where I'm kind of settled in playwriting, when does your art form ever get forced to be innovative? And so during 2020 and 2021, we got really cool with the comp sci students. We were doing like choose your own adventure uh, Zoom plays where the students had to set up like command centers with like 18 computers. Um, so all these uh, individuals, you can see one uh, scene uh, where like two people are talking and then like, do you want to follow Luke or do you want to follow Megan and you get a link and then everybody starts operating their own Zoom rooms. It was really cool. Um, so that was the technical side of it, which was which was really neat and had and I didn't know how much writing and like what is how is multiple zoom rooms linked to the theme of kind of what we're kind of talking about um so we did a, a show, that choose your own adventure zoom play was about uh, sex sexploitation um and video gaming like blackmailing like children for like their mom's credit card numbers after they've already sent like illicit pictures of themselves to people they don't know and so we had fbi agents come in and talk to the audience as they were kind of going in that thing so it was kind of a and so to get people like professionals to come talk about their fields to uh, after something a creative writing thing that you wrote and also trying to uh, guide these students through sort of that journey and why it was needed in the world um, i think was something i was only able to pull off uh, due to my uh, due to my time here at webster with the, the, the critical thought um, that, that was kind of built here um, and so we do that we build up this program we get a lot of students in and um, my I get a screenplay that uh, is a finalist for the screen craft uh, competition um, and then um, I don't know where I'm going I'm sorry I'm, like, <laughs> I'm just thinking about everything you guys said um, and so maintaining a, a screenplay competitions and winning those and uh, I'm in writing rooms out in LA uh, or like during the pandemic, they're all over Zoom now, right? And I'm like, oh man, this is my dream job. I want to write for television. I want to write for television so bad. So I get inside two TV rooms. And uh, what does that mean to get inside the room? Uh, so, I mean, are you working for them? Or? Yeah, well, one of them was a development process. It was a development house. And so it's like, oh my God, I need more than 15 minutes to try to define all that business. But one was a development house where you come in, they have an idea, you're supposed to help develop it as a group, group of like nine writers, and then they're gonna go pitch it, they're gonna take it to market. Um, for some reason, I got in with some people who develop European procedurals. Um, so they want like you know, episodic uh, shows. And one uh, was successfully, uh, just kind of took it to market uh, a few weeks ago, but it was like a year ago that we were working on it. Um, but I realized really quick, like, working in the theater in St. Louis and trying to fill the gap of what's needed story-wise here is a lot more rewarding than the TV room of something that's trying to do that you're working with so many different personalities and they're getting blasted and I'm like, oh, this is not very fun. Uh, this is not fun at all. Like, Tom is taking control of this whole thing and he's not listening to anybody's ideas and stuff like that. So uh, collaborative TV writing, I found, uh, not to be as rewarding as I, I had hoped. Um, so I stick back, I don't leave uh, Rala, um, and so I end up finding my calling uh, directing a bunch of, of 
engineers in a musical called Heather's uh, last fall. And I make this big sweeping Facebook post. I'm giving up on my film career. I'm just this. I want to teach engineers how to sing and dance uh, in southern Missouri. This is words for awarding and everything like that. And then, then Leonardo DiCaprio's uh, production company hits me up for a pilot I wrote. Um, and so I'm like, oh my god, okay. We'll take this one meeting. And through the development phase of that, um, they say you have to come out to LA. You have to live in LA. To, well, you have to work here. We at least need you for 32 weeks straight. Um, can you do this? And at that time, that was January 2022 this year, because uh, that's sort of the season of, of, of show development, so you can probably maybe hit that fall. With the streaming services, the whole season is kind of changing, but some production companies kind of stay, stay in that realm. Um, we had two students of Missouri s &T take their own lives in January and February of this year. And so I was like, hey, you know what? I, I don't want to leave these particular students just yet. So um, we stay there. We do. Uh, we put on like seven seven shows in, in the last like uh, twelve months uh, there. And and I was like, oh, you know, I'm gonna give up on this film thing again. I'm just like, I'm not gonna do it. Um, I just uh, it's not rewarding. Um, it feels like these students need me at s &T. And so now we have. Uh, I I wrote some short films a couple years ago that I just gave away. I was like, if you want to do anything with this, if you want to do anything with that, you can just kind of do it. Um, and now they're getting, uh, somebody made a couple and they're going through the film festival. We just found out they're in the, film, the fifth uh, film festival right now. Um, and so I really don't know where I'm going with this. <laughs> uh, I'm sort of at this crossroads of this creative entrepreneurship and teaching. I felt like, um, like when you said like teaching, like, you know, it's not for everybody. Um, but I'm finding out it, it really is uh, for me, and so the difficulty for me to have my own sort of writing career and teach in Rala is kind of where I'm at right now. Um, and I'm finding out that um, my skills that I learned at Webster are, are really suited for me out at the university level because Missouri s and is famously like not artistic. Like, they don't give much funding to the arts programs there and stuff like that. And so we're finding grants. We're starting an entertainment engineering technology uh, major right now uh, that they're weirdly letting me sort of take charge in um, because of uh, I'm writing successful grants. Um, that's another thing. How, how, how many people in here are interested in creative writing career? Um, yeah, it's sort of a juggle, right? Like if you have to be able to kind of market yourself and like where's like where's your next paycheck coming? Um, and so, just like anything else, like technically you're saying, like outside of literature, you have to write for somebody. Um, I'm finding out, and this is all coming to a head, I promise. Um, I'm finding out no matter what I'm doing, what you're writing are rarely ever English majors. <laughs> um, I'm uh, like, I was I was in a CW writing room for two weeks, and very, and then I heard somebody say, "Hey, Marvel does it this way." And they're like, we don't want to be Marvel. And somebody goes, why? Because they're successful. That guy was fired. <laughs> <laughs> was like, oh man. So it's like, I don't want to be writing this. And I'm like, what's? And I'm like, and it's rewarding here in Missouri. I'm like, so um, who who do you want to write for? Um, can you sacrifice your time and your sort of voice uh, to in order to pay your bills? Do you want to do something like that? Um, do you want to work with? You want to work with mean people. Um, so there's that. So that's what I'm going through right now. I sort of don't have an answer since I'm kind of making all those choices right now. But in St. Louis, we do have the Tesseract Theater Company, which uh, we prominently do brand new plays um, and dramaturgy. Is anybody interested in dramaturgy in here? Do you guys know what that is? Some, some people don't know. Okay, dramaturgy is kind of this. Um, it's a defense for the play, even against the playwright. Um, you help, uh, most likely a new play dramaturgy, you help the playwright with their vision. Like you're, you're doing this, it seems like you're asking these kind of questions, but like by the end of this play, you forgot all those questions, and you're not doing this anymore. So you're kind of helping the playwright kind of solidify their vision, not trying to put your own stuff on top of the play, but your vision. And so, like a workshop. Almost. Very much the feedback thing, giving yeah. and taking feedback um, is wildly, uh, horrific in what I, everything I do. Um, and so I get, a, I get a lot of credit in those rooms, um, and I get forward. 
um, right now it's, it's really my dramaturgy kind of, of, of people inquiring about my dramaturgy uh, fell off for a while in 2020. But now um, it's kind of coming back because a lot of plays that I dramaturg, they're getting productions around the country simply because of, of structure ability. Your character's coming on page five. Um, and saying, hey, I'm going to go leave to go get a bag of smoke. Somebody doesn't come back until page 8 be like, what happened to Uncle Bill? <laughs> um, and so, it, you know, so stuff like that. And so um, a lot of people um, are, are getting productions after, after the feedback um, I'm giving them. Uh, we had a student at Webster. Her play that she did in our playwriting class is getting done all over this country right now. Aurora, <gasps> yes. Aurora, yeah. Aurora uh, founders, founders uh, keepers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Aurora from the conservatory. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Directing major. Yeah. Oh, yeah, super cool. super cool. Yeah. Wow. She is. It's it, it's. What's the play about? Um. It's uh. There's maybe an apocalyptic event, and a bunch of like fifth graders go into uh <laughs> go into a room, and we're like, well, it's up to us to write the new uh, constitution. <laughs> <laughs> Um, while they're getting like their periods for the first time, and now you know they're getting jealous of somebody else's attention, and so it's like this like hyper feminist constitution that is being founded in real time, and it's um, a lot of theaters are really like responding to it in a really cool way. So, so I think we probably are getting close. Yeah, that's to my whole spiel. Where I'm at in my well, career, but <laughs> well, I want to say one. Well, I want to ask you one more thing. So it's my impression, Taylor, that a lot of much written. Well, I don't know what your intention was, and I'm not going to assume. Mm -hmm. um, but they seem to have possibly have the be able to have the impact of making the world a better place. Like they seem to be about social issues and bringing things to life that people might not know about, like the Water Creek. And um, would you say that's a motivation? Yeah, I write plays that require a lot of research, a lot of bio uh, and medical ethics. Like I've had a play called Adverse Effects uh, that was written about opioids um, and and medication that has caused uh, teenagers to commit suicide. Um, and that play went off and went like there's a school in Virginia called the Carilion School of Medicine. They used that play uh, to tea at the end of the semester. They would put that play on and then ask the doctors what the graduating doctors what they would have done. Um, I wrote a play about the nuclear waste in Coldwater Creek. Um, the post-dispatch uh, post writers that were dealing with that in the 80s and 90s came and saw it and said it was correct. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, so social, yeah, a lot of stuff is aimed at social change, like what's going on. Uh, the only thing that sucks about that sometimes is my play Adverse Effects was getting a lot of productions, and then Dope Sick came out, that Hulu series with Michael Keaton, that used the same research, like the same testimonies and like, uh, uh, depositions that I was using. Before. There are some like straight sentences that I stole from a woman in her deposition <laughs> that Dobzik did too, and then all of a sudden nobody's doing my play anymore. Um, so um, what you write about current events is something you wrote years ago. And then when we were doing the Coldwater Creek one, it was the whole ending was about how the EPA did not give us um, any sort of settlement yet. And two days before we opened, the EPA put out a <laughs> settlement that was horrible. So I had to write the last 15 pages of the play and hand it to the actors like like two days before it opened. Oh wow! They <laughs> weren't very thrilled. But if you're writing about stuff in like now, the now, it can win screenplay competition and go out there. But all of a sudden, two years, it's it's no longer relevant. And so you, when you're a creative uh, entrepreneur, I guess is the words that you were using, um, you run the risk of writing a whole, putting like a lot of work into one screenplay, and then one big social event can happen, and you're like that is. No longer relevant. Yeah. Um, so you just got to cool that. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> so now we have some time for questions. So uh, you know that you're going to take off. So if anybody needs to leave, this would be a great time. And uh, and then if you have questions, you know the drill. You raise your hand.
degree. Um, so just bear that in mind. If you're like, I want to be a librarian, but I want to be in high school, um, you're going to need an extra degree. That's it. That's all we got. Surely someone has some question. Yeah, so this is for uh, anybody up there, but specifically Taylor. So whenever you're keeping busy with all these things that you're doing, how do you keep a sustainable creative writing practice that uh, you know, you can you can have time for while also maintaining all of these other responsibilities that you're juggling. And how does anybody else, if you have continued to do creative writing, how do you keep up with that in your lives now, if you can? And it, how did you do it as a student, even? Cool. Um, you don't. You, find, you have to risk and sacrifice certain things at every given time. Uh, sometimes it's the marriage. Uh, <laughs> sometimes it's uh, family events. Sometimes it's work deadlines, um, it's the fact like, do you have something you want to say? And if you think you have something you want to say, um, you got to get it done. And so you got to fight for that time. You got to find that sliver, that hour that you can go into the cafe and then you it down. Uh, but ask yourself, do you have something you want to say?